Hello and welcome to another episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. Today I have for you a conversation with somebody who's not been on the show before, brand new guest. His name is Jack Vizhnik. Now, uh, Jack is the author of a new book called The Invention of Duty, where he kind of uh, dives in very deep into the term and, and tries to rediscover the, the roots of this term or this, this, this idea of moral duty. And he believes that you can tie it right back to the ancient Stoics, that they were the originators of this term. And so, in today's conversation, we really cover that idea of moral duty. Where does it come from and what does it mean? Uh, And also, practically, what does it mean for our lives? So, uh, before we jump into the interview, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jack. So, Jack Vizhnik is a classicist and historian of philosophy interested in uncovering long-term patterns in history. He has a Bachelor in Classics and Mathematics from Columbia University and a PhD in Ancient Philosophy from Princeton. His book, The Invention of Duty, explores the origins of the notion of moral duty in Greco-Roman antiquity and claims that the Stoics were, in a sense, the originators of the term. In his podcast, Ancient Greece Declassified, he brings modern scholarship on the ancient Mediterranean to a popular audience. So, there are links in the show notes to where you can grab his book and where you can follow him online as well. Uh, But I also just want to say before we jump into the podcast that this show would not be possible without my incredible Patreon supporters. And if you do have the means to do so, please head over to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew and you can get a whole bunch of extra content over there as well as access to meetup groups and masterclasses and all sorts of things. So, without any further ado, I present to you my conversation with Jack Vizhnik. All right, Jack, I'm happy to have you here, mate. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. Um, I guess uh, it, let, let, let's let's start by saying, um, well, let me start by saying that you've obviously spent a lot of your life working on this book that you've now released called The Invention of Duty. And so this whole conversation, I imagine, will kind of flow around that term duty. What does it mean? Where does it come from? Um, uh, but nonetheless, you also just have a rich experience in philosophy and, and seeking wisdom. And that's what I want to find out as well is uh, your experience in philosophy. But uh, I'm going to give you a chance now just to uh, tell me anything and everything that you would want me and the audience to know about yourself. All right. Well, thanks, first of all, so much for having me on your show. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so this book came out of many years of study uh, in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and in the Stoics in particular. I actually went to college intending to do physics, but I went to one of the few colleges in America where you still have to read the quote unquote great books. And uh, upon reading Plato, I felt like I discovered something I was looking for for many years, um, like a way of thinking about deep questions, like what is love, what is justice, what is beauty, what is duty? Although Plato doesn't (laughs) actually discuss that concept, but he discusses, um, you know, he he offers ways of thinking about these concepts. So I got sucked in, um, fast forward a bunch of years, I'm finishing my PhD on the Stoics. And then I spent a few years after that, um, expanding on my work. And that's where this book is from. So Mm. Yeah, man. So it, it's interesting to hear that you kind of, you went into this thinking, okay, physics is going to be the path for me. But I'm, I'm always really, really happy to hear when people think that they want to go in one direction, but then get caught in another and decide this is actually the right path. Because that, to me, it, it speaks to a certain um, maturity, this ability to not just be dog-headedly focused on like, I'm only going down this path, but to be deeply interested in what is actually calling to you as a person. Um, So exactly what was it like? What was that moment like for you when you finally decided, yeah, okay, this is not the right path. I've got to go and explore the classics. Like specifically, what was it that that drew you into that? Yeah, well, I'd like to think it's the kind of maturity, but I think it was maybe the opposite, uh, more of rebelliousness because my family is full of scientists. So I was okay. kind of uh, the black sheep, I guess, in, in taking a different course. But, you know, um, 
Well, I guess what one thing that kind of always puzzled me in high school, especially English class, which is where you read kind of um, thought provoking books in high school, was that there was never any criterion of truth. Okay, like the, the assignment was, you know, you finish Huckleberry Finn and they say, okay, write an essay where you argue whether the book is uh, anti slavery or or pro slavery. OK, and it doesn't matter which of those two things you argue, as long as you back it up, as long as you have a five paragraph structure, introduction, conclusion, three body paragraphs, you expand your argument, you can get an A. And that really bothered mm. me that like that there's no it doesn't matter what you say as long as you market it well. Um, mm. And and then when I had to read Plato in college, like that's exactly Plato's beef with the sophists It's like you guys basically teach people to argue any case, but you make it persuasive and then people succeed and that's what you're selling right so uh, i guess i just clicked on that note and um and i and i appreciated that you can at least strive for objectivity and truth when you discuss these um you know uh humanistic concerns mm. Mm. yeah it kind of reminds me of uh one of my favorite rants from seneca <clears throat> where he's going on about how most students uh, come to hear the philosopher as if it's a form of entertainment, you know, as if they're there for a show and they leave and they haven't really changed anything. Or, you know, when you said, you know, it's about marketing your ideas rather than, you know, what is the real standard of truth here that it just reminded me of that because Seneca had a real, he had a real beef with philosophers who were there to entertain or to, and, and, um, man, it gets me thinking, you know, how much of what I do is that and how can I move away from being that, <laughs> that thing? But, okay. So you, you started getting interested in this idea of what is truth. You got sucked into Plato, uh, brought you into it. How, how do we get from there to now you're obsessed with this question about duty? So another book that really influenced me in, in college was Nietzsche's essay on the genealogy of morals mm -hmm. and when i first when i first uh was assigned this book and i and i and i thought and i was heard okay this is a book on ethics that what is ethics it's just blah blah like you know there were courses in high school in ethics and all the kids that took those courses um you know were the same kids that were in the debate club you know and i don't know it just it was like what what's the big deal but then you get into the book and um whether Nietzsche is right or not is besides the point. But what is interesting is that he said ethics change over time due to social conditions, political influences, different groups struggling for power, et cetera. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Like the ideas we take for granted ethically are not always the same across cultures. And he focuses in particular on the idea of evil. So the idea of evil, he thought, uh, did not exist in early ancient Greek and early Roman thought. It was, for him, imported into Greco-Roman thought via Christianity. Hmm. Um, and when I went to grad school, my advisor was actually really interested in that concept. And he was looking at the notion of evil in late or later Roman philosophers. And I started noticing that a lot of things had shifted between the time of Plato and Aristotle and the time of Seneca that you like so much, um, besides Christianity being just bubbling out into existence at the time, and perhaps the notion of evil catching on, there were a lot of new ways of thinking. Um, the notion of guilt, some have argued, was starting to replace the notion of shame as the main you know, negative check on our on our actions. Um, and another concept that I had heard or read was new was the idea of moral duty that that was that was absent from the Greeks. It was just there like in a semi formed nascent state in the Romans. And then it came to full fruition in the Enlightenment with Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. Mm. And I was like, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, I didn't have any reason to challenge that view. And, and when my advisor asked for some proposals for my PhD thesis, I sent him three. And one of them was, well, you know, we, we've we all been taught that duty is a modern concept, but has certain antecedents, certain seeds in the ancient world. So I'd like to just explore those seeds, see what are the, what are the concepts that fed into 
the later notion of duty. Hmm. Um, but long story short, after really digging in, I kept seeing these this one concept in particular in the Stoics that that looked a lot like duty. The scholars were saying, oh, it can't be duty because that's not yet available to them. Um, but, and, and you know, we don't have, we, our sources are very incomplete for the early Stoics. So, um, but the more I looked through the fragments and the early testimonies and then the later sources, the more I came to be convinced that actually this was already duty. And so mm -hmm. that's how the, the new project took shape. And it was more about exploring uh, first establishing that this really does mean duty, which took a long time to go through all of the um, all of the surviving cases where these words were used to check the context to actually argue for each case that it seems to to be a compelling notion of duty rather than just appropriate action, which was the preferred translation up until now. Um, mm -hmm. And then to map out, okay, so what actually was the theory? Um, how do we reconstruct it? Because we don't have it fully explained anywhere, and um, and then finally to compare it with the later Enlightenment views. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and 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 I think what I'm very interested in with your work is, you know, often in society, well, okay, that's a silly way of putting it. To me, it seems like we can get very um, comfortable with the fact that we have these terms, we have these ideas very rarely do we actually think, hang on, this idea began somewhere and revolutionized the way that we think, right? And we throw this term duty around all the time. Um, I've done it on my podcast a lot. Um, the question of, even the question of where does duty come from? Why do we have a duty? These sorts of things are the things that you're wrestling with as well in your work. Um, and I guess I, I was just interested, you know, because we always think, oh, we just have this term and it's just with us, but we never think, okay, where is the actual root? So what, what came before duty? What were the philosophers talking about before they had this, this, this way of thinking about it? Um, and what led into the formulation of duty? And perhaps maybe in your answer also tell us exactly what do you mean when you say duty? And how does that relate to how the philosophers use the term? There's four questions for you in one. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. How can I pack them together? Okay. So, well, first, what is a duty? I mean, a duty is just something that you have to do. Okay. But the key term here is moral duty. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's widely accepted that the Greeks had, and the Romans, they had duties, like they had religious duties, civic duties, family duties, all that kind of stuff. But the idea that, but in all those cases, there's an external source of authority, you know, either the priesthood or the gods or the laws, the military. Um, the idea that you could have a purely moral duty without any external source of compulsion, just your inner sense that you have to do this because it's the right thing to do, right? That is what is thought to be something that um, Immanuel Kant really developed. Now, why do people think so? So, how is this conceivably absent from the ancient uh, world? Well, one take that is very popular among modern philosophers is to say, well, the ancients were not interested in the question, what must I do, which is the central question of modern ethics. Their central question was, how can I be happy? And so, everything that the ancient philosophers said you should do was instrumental towards happiness as the goal. Okay, so that's one. Um, take on it. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's way too simplistic a picture. Uh, so th the answer I kind of give out, given the book to this question is before duty, when Plato and Socrates and Aristotle are, are considering or deliberating, what should I do in this situation or in, in this hypothetical ethical dilemma, they usually pick a specific virtue. Like what would the just thing to do be here or what would the courageous thing be or what would the patient thing or the uh holy thing or the kind thing all that kind of stuff right so, so they had these separate each virtue kind of offered an avenue that would point you to the right direction when you deliberate and there was never a sense that they all have to converge but that's what the stoics claim the stoics come and they say actually every single virtue 
points to the exact same target, like a bunch of archers all aiming at the same target. And so if you think of what the just thing to do is and what the courageous thing to do is, those should converge. If they don't, you got to rethink your calculation because you're doing something wrong. And mm -hmm. so there is this, um, and of course, this requires a conception of the universe as ordered and rationally guided by a benevolent deity. Uh, but if you do kind of accept that overarching framework where nature is always pointing you in the direction and offering all the virtues as different signposts towards the same goal, that's your duty. And so what changed is that one concept came to be an umbrella term that offered, um, that kind of subsumed all earlier avenues of deliberation and the idea that you were never free from this obligation. You know, for Plato and Aristotle, it was important to have time off. The word skole, where we get school from, actually means leisure. So, like you know, people people philosophize during their leisure time. It was important, you know, as a as a citizen, as a free citizen, not a slave, to have time to take a break and to think about things. For the Stoics, they said, "No, you're always under the demands of duty." Mm. It it could be your duty to take a break, but that's still your duty. You know, there's no two ways about it. Mm, okay. And, and, and so, you know, one of the things that I've heard you say is uh, duty is that which reason commands, right? Which is an mm -hmm. interesting thing to think about, right? But, but then when you say, okay, we're always under the demands of duty, it's always calling us to do something uh, particular. Where, where, is, where is that command coming from? You know, if if reason commands, you know, you you would expect that. Okay, so to command, it's like there's something. Uh, yeah, where where is it coming from? You know, where what's calling us to do better? That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's start with this definition you mentioned. The the Stoics and the sources we have, they never fully explain what duty is, or what the concepts I take to be duty is, namely officium in Latin and katheikon in Greek. Uh, the, the, the sources we have are writing 300 years after the original Stoics. So they use terms without defining them because they figure, well, our readers have been reading this stuff for 300 years. There's no reason to define these things, right? So we need to, to, to kind of reverse engineer what the terms originally meant. But they do offer these um, attributes or what I call quasi definitions. They're not full definitions, but they help. So, and one of them is that duty is that which reason commands that we do. Um, now you can unpack that for a whole lecture. I, mean, I won't do that now, so don't worry, but for, embedded in that little phrase <clears throat> are a bunch of stoic ideas. So one is that um, reason commands. And this is important because these are not Platonists. Platonists believe that the soul has at least three parts and two of them are not rational. So there are non-rational sources of impulse towards action. Mm. So we can be towards motivated- Towards good to, action can, or just action? No, towards action in general. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, they think, they, they think that good action is also mm. um, commanded by reason, but, but there are many sources of- of um, us doing things, many internal motivational sources. For the Stoics, the, the mind is like a homogeneous rational computer. It's got no irrational parts to it. When we, when we behave irrationally, it's not because our irrational part or our emotions are taking over. It's not, it's not because our id is conquering our ego, like in Freudian terms. It's because our computer, which is our brain or, or our soul, is malfunctioning. It's, it's failing to properly evaluate what information is given to it, okay? Mm. And the information that's given to it are what's, what are called impressions. Uh, the term in Greek is fantasiae, where we get fantasy from. And this is a term that goes back to Aristotle already, who's explaining, um, like, fantasia for Aristotle is a kind of cognition available to animals, and humans, but you know, even though human, even though animals don't have reason, they can still kind of process impressions and stuff. Now, for the Stoics, when we get these impressions, um, we can decide whether to accept them or to reject them. 
and the 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 sage, the wise human, is the perfect calculator. Just fil- fils like do 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 like instantly filtering all the true ones and discarding all the false ones. And the thing is that when you ascend to a true one, which contains, you know, the impression that you should do something, you have to do it. It's like it's deterministic of your action, right? So, hmm. so basically, when our mind, which is a rational calculator, receives an impression that something is to be done, it if it if it operates correctly, it will seize on that, and it will make us do it. And nature, again, is this benevolent, rational thing. I mean, it's permeated by uh, Zeus, which is who is a rational artisan permeating the universe and directing us. And so we are fed mm. commands basically by the rational universe on what to do. And if we correctly interpret those commands, we will do our duty. Mm. So that's one thing I was wondering, you know, are we talking about reason with a capital R, you know, as in the, the, the reason of or universal reason as the Stoics have often called it. And so that's, that's always my question, right? I mean, I'm, I'm currently a student of theology. I'm doing a, a, master of divinity potentially just a master of theology but you know i'm really interested in these questions of like uh you know well we can say that we have a duty and that we are called to do something but what's actually below that what what do we see as the the actual main source of that and when when it comes to the stoics i've been um very interested in in the way that they talk about you know being a part of the cosmos uh, and almost as if they are uh, dropping into the, how do I put this, man? Dropping into the oneness of everything, um, being the one rational universe that we are a part of and finding access to a deeper communication with that source that can help us to understand how to live virtuously. Um, it's, it's all very fascinating stuff, but I wonder, um, there was something that, okay. I wanted to dive in a little bit into these definitions here because I want to get you talking to Kai Whiting and, uh, Leo, uh, Constantikos. Have you, have you met either of those people yet? I haven't met them, but I've seen them on your show and yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk to them. That man, they're great, they're great people, and um, they're probably going to be pissed at you because, <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know, a lot of um, a lot of their work is based around this idea of appropriate action. Um, so, talk to me about. So, uh, sorry, the the word is cathacon, cathacon, uh, cathacon. Yeah, yeah, cathacon. Cathacon. That's uh, it. Cathacon, and then the plural are cathaconta. Okay. Okay. So, so this, so Cathacon, Cathacon um, basically means what well, people have interpreted it as appropriate action. Your problem with this is it actually seems a lot more like moral duty. Uh, how did you come to discovering that difference that you have? And what are the implications of changing appropriate action to moral duty? So the <laughs> good question. Um, there actually is no consensus on what to translate it as. Uh, a lot of scholars use appropriate actions. Some say befitting actions. Some say fitting actions. Some say proper function. There's a whole range. They tend to cluster around this idea of appropriateness. And the main difference between that and a duty is just the, the kind of the degree of obligation or how binding it is. So if something is appropriate, it's not really, it doesn't sound very binding. You know, it's like, yeah, you, you kind of should, you should have, would have, could have done it, but you know, it wasn't a, like a law, right? Um, mm. To say that it's a duty means it's really binding. So that's, that's the question. How, how, how binding is this term? And the thing is that, you know, when, when we scholars, do our work, we, we rely on dictionaries to tell us what words mean. Okay. But these dictionaries were written over 150 years ago. Like the main English dictionary of ancient Greek is the Liddell Scott Jones, which despite recent updates, hasn't, hasn't really substantially changed since, I don't know, 1830 something. Mm. And the German ones that are 
considered on par are also from that time period. Okay, so, so we're relying on old scholarship to tell us what these words mean. And the dictionary tells us that that word me can mean appropriate action. It, it, all, it also tells us that it can mean duty, but according to the dictionary, both of those meanings are available. And mm. nobody has, has really gone through, nobody has done the work that they did back then when making the dictionary to, to check it or update it, okay? So that's what I did. Uh, thanks to modern tools, all these texts have been digitized. So I can just search that word in my computer and I can instantly see every single case sorted by century where that word appears, okay? And this is what they did by hand back in the day. It took like tons of grad students working sleepless nights uh, under the supervision of a few Oxford dons, you know, but uh, now I just do it from my, from my computer. It's mm. still, a lot of hard, it's still a lot of work. Um, and the key is to just go through all these cases and try to figure out from the context what the meaning is, which is what they did back then, okay? Mm. And... Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that when the Stoics picked this word, kathekon, to be their main ethical term, it was never used in philosophy before. So they're introducing a new term. They're consciously avoiding more common terms that you know the Platonists and Aristotelians were using, and they're picking a new term. So they're kind of making a, a claim of originality there. But that word did exist. And the, the question is, what did it mean before the Stoics came on the scene? Because they must have picked it because it already offered some meaning that they wanted to use. They, they didn't, I'm sure they didn't just create a new meaning for a word that would make no sense. Right. Yeah. So by carefully going through every pre-Stoic instance of this word, I think you can pretty clearly see that it almost always carries a strong notion of obligation because it's almost, it's usually used in the context of laws or decrees or fixed times for a festival and the times are fixed by the laws. Um, it's often used in conjunction with verbs of ordering. So you'll see sentences like, the commander ordered the troops to blank and the troops did not hesitate to do their kathekon. So it implies that the kathekon is that which was ordered by the commander, right? So from all these different clues and contexts, um, just by doing this work that hasn't been done in 150 years, I just laid it out that actually this word has to mean something very obligatory. So let's revise our definition. Mm, mm. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've done this work. Hey, cause it is interesting to think that, you know, we kind of rely on certain scholarship potentially for longer than we need to, you know, we need to go back and revisit these things. And this is why I think uh, you'll have a very interesting conversation with Kai and Leo. Maybe we could do like a like a a four way conversation sometime, um, even on the show. Yeah, totally. have, have a whole debate around it. But uh, you know, I th I think that um, it it makes more sense to me that there is this notion of duty being something that is kind of required. And the reason why I would say that is because the moments that I, if I look at my life and if we get practical here and think about, okay, how does duty actually manifest itself in our lives? I think about the moments when, well, let, let me give you this sort of example. I, I often have moments where I think about uh, the potential that is locked within me that I'm not bringing out into the world. And to me, when I think about that and when I really think about, okay, what are the consequences of me not unlocking certain parts of myself and allowing that to come out into the world, that there's a real sense that, especially if you look at it through this kind of stoic framework of you're a part of everything, you're connected to everything within the cosmos, and therefore you can pretty quickly see how everything that you do sends ripples throughout the cosmos and, and affects everything really. Uh, when I have that sense of what I would call duty, it's, it's more of a, a, a really itchy feeling within me that says, you know that there's one way that is the correct way of doing this and that you should do it. And to do otherwise would be to go against uh, something that you know to be true and reasonable and appropriate, right? Um, but it's not, it's not just, well, maybe I should do this, maybe I... I shouldn't it's no this is the thing that you need to do 
and and there's a real deep feeling there. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about in terms of a a, a much a much uh, maybe a much more grabby feeling of you know this is something that you need to do. And if so, how do you discern that feeling? Let's get practical for for people at home who might want to understand how they can recognize the feeling of duty. The Stoics would they probably resist saying the feeling because as I said, they want um, they want to have this psychological model of the soul where, we are rational calculators, right? Mm. So um, just remember you're talking to an artist here. So like y- yes. nothing sounds more boring to me <laughs> than my no, mind and- being a <laughs> rational computing machine. But nonetheless, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, no, and I, I completely agree. From. I mean, I mean, this yeah. is this is the main, this is what I think is the main Achilles heel of stoic ethics is that their psychology is is just untenable. You know, we mm. are heavily irrational creatures. Yeah. Um, the Stoics reduce us to rational creatures. And uh, I think they gain a lot by doing that. And they've been tremendously successful and influential because they did that. But I, I agree that at, at its core, there's something really problematic there. Um, it's interesting because the kind of feeling you were describing is something that, that Kant appeals to a lot. You know, he, he mm. goes through these, exper- these thought experiments where he kind of he, he tells you to imagine that you're witnessing some injustice and, and he expects you as a reader to feel like, yeah, yeah, I would feel inside that this is just wrong, you know? Um, I'm not sure I remember any passage like that in the Stoics. The, I mean, there are some shortcuts, okay? So Epictetus, Epictetus's favorite shortcut is to think of your relationships. He says, like, think of your relationships. You are you know, you, Simon, are a, you're a son, you know, maybe you're a brother, you're a cousin, you are a citizen um, of a certain place. And all of those relationships uh, for Epictetus spell out obvious and intuitive duties. Okay, so any kind of label you can put on yourself that you accept as part of your identity and which indicates a relationship with other humans will instantly call to mind duty. So your brother, okay, so you got to be a good brother. You got to take care of your siblings when they're in need and probably even when they're not in need, right? Check in on them. Um, you're a citizen. So you should, everything you do should be compatible with the common interest, the common good of your country, right? So that's kind of the the Epic, Epictetus's formula for that. Hmm. And, and if I could just, Pull you up on one thing there. I mean, like even while describing that, you said you'll look at these certain relationships that you have, and you'll you'll see an intuitive duty that you have within those relationships. Intuitive. Uh, in that, I mean, to, philosophers have debated this for centuries, but you know, you don't have to dig that deep to realize that all of your reason is founded upon an intuition. Uh, that that that. It's it's pretty it's pretty difficult to go below a certain level uh, when you're digging into where does my reason come from, where do my decisions come from, what actually makes right or wrong, um, and in the end, I mean, to me, it just seems like it all does come down to ultimately, uh, maybe not ultimately, that's the wrong way to put it. We all have these intuitions. Um, and I think that the relationship side of things is a good way to go with this because uh, ultimately we do have intuitions about how we should be acting in our relationships, what our duties to those people are. And I'm wondering um, what what has changed about, well, no, let's not go there first. Let's first dive into who actually invented this term duty. Who was the first person that you know of? And how did it develop over time? Like, so how did they see it back then compared to how we usually view it today? The first person who our sources tell us uh, used this term in an ethical context, Kathekon, was Zeno of Kidium, the founder of Stoicism. The story goes, he's he's a merchant from Cyprus and he gets shipwrecked near Athens makes it to Athens alive, um, lost all his cargo, fortune gone. And there he encounters these um, 
funny fellows named philosophers, some of whom still remember from, you know, some of them are old enough to remember Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And the story goes that he goes into a bookshop and he picks up Xenophon's uh, dialogues of Socrates. And it's important that it's Xenophon dialogues because the Stoics want to say we're not Platonists, right? We go back mm. to the real Socrates as preserved by Xenophon, who didn't have like a philosophical axe to grind. Um, and he's he's just reading this book and thinking, wow, like where can I meet such people? And it just so happened that at that time, you know, Crates, the philosopher, the cynic, uh, was walking outside and the bookseller said, oh, just follow that guy. You know, so he goes there. Uh, trains as a cynic for a while, but the cynics were way too hardcore for him. You know, they, they basically were like hermit monks, you know, don't care about anything in the world, only virtue, you know, don't eat, eat just lentils and, and stale bread. Don't buy new clothes, sleep in the streets if necessary, you know, but just focus on your virtue. And mm -hmm. Zeno, he, he, he wanted something more cosmopolitan, more civic, right? So he, so he seems to have um, added this new notion of kathekon or duty, which says that yes, virtue is the only thing that's really good. That, that's a cynic idea. The cynics already established that the only true good is virtue. The only true bad thing is vice. Nothing that people normally call good is actually good. Money is not good. Wealth is not good. You know, beauty is not good. It's virtue that's the only good. And Zeno says, well, you know what? You know, that reduces people to basically um, philosopher hobos. And while that might be good for them, it's, it's not enough to sustain a society. So he adds this kind of second tier of not quite good, but valuable, right? So yeah, money and wealth, those are not good in the pure sense, but they're valuable. And so we should still choose them and we still have a duty to choose them. And so mm. he kind of takes the, the, the hardcore backbone of cynicism and then he adds this extra layer of duty to it which tells you actually you should own a house and you should marry and you should have kids and you should vote or take office or participate in your in your government you know and you should do all these things none of them are actually good in the sense of none of those things is pure virtue but they have value and it's your duty to select the highest value for you and your community. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. You know, I've often thought about this, uh, not in terms of you should have these things, but in terms of, well, I like the analogy. I think it's Epictetus who gives this one says like treat life like a banquet, you know, as things are being passed around, take a little, you know, accept what is your portion, then pass it on. Um, meaning, you know, if if you have the opportunity uh, or the potential to own a house or to, uh, you know, get a job that pays you well uh, so that you can take care of your family and your community. And if you have the opportunity and, and the wherewithal to be in politics and stuff like that, accept those things uh, gracefully. Um, but nonetheless, always keep in mind that if they're taken away from you, that's fine because they're not ultimately what's good anyway. Is that also the sense that you get? Or do you feel like there's a little bit more of a you should pursue these things? You know, I'm so glad that you brought up that passage in Epictetus because that I think is crucial for understanding duty. Okay. Um, when Zeno, the one thing we know about Zeno introducing this ethical term is that he explained it with a certain phrase. Okay, he, he said, kathekon is that which in Greek, katatinas hekein, which I'm not going to translate because it can be translated in a million different ways. And that's why it's been debated so much. Okay. Um, now, this this etymology is not a real etymology, okay? Like almost always when an ancient Greek philosopher um, explains a word by, with a phrase that sounds like it, it's not meant to be what we would call a linguistically um, valid etymology. It's, it's usually like a, a joke or a play on words. It's, it's meant to make a point. It's not meant to actually describe the history of that word. So kathekon definitely does not come from that phrase. It's, 
it's a play on words that Zeno is using to illustrate its meaning. But since that, since those three words can mean a million different things, and since the the original meaning is uncertain, we've basically been trying to to stand on two shaky planks to figure out what's going on, and you know that's just uh, hard to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the the one other place in all of Greek literature where we get a phrase similar to that is in exactly that passage you mentioned where Epictetus says, imagine life is like a banquet and dishes are being passed around. And he says, don't reach out to grab a dish. If a dish comes to you, and here's the important thing, if it kind of comes to rest in front of you, it's not moving past you. If it actually comes to rest in front of you, then you can politely and moderately take a little bit of whatever is on offer there. Okay. And that coming to rest in front of you, I think, is is exactly what that earlier phrase Zeno uh, used means. So what Zeno is saying is that a a kathekon is that which basically comes to rest in front of you. It's put before you. Now, who is putting it before you? Nature, the providence of nature. This is this interpretation, I think, is further confirmed by um phrases you find all over marcus aurelius and seneca too but mainly marcus where he says like don't go looking for your duty like do the task at hand do the thing in front of you you know there's this idea that um one shouldn't one shouldn't go off to some faraway land seeking virtue or seeking to do good to the world one should one should um as I think Julia Annis puts it, one should kind of embody the virtue of our station, okay? Mm. Um, And so, yeah, so the idea there is that at any given time, there is a task at hand. There is something, there's a task placed before you by nature or life or fate or chance, which are all the same thing, and you should just do that. Mm. It sounds very similar to this quote that I love, uh, tend to the part of the garden that you can touch. And the Stoics certainly had this way of saying, why do you want to travel? You're not going to find virtue over there. You're not going to you know, find yourself because you take yourself with you wherever you go. You're just going to face the same old problems. And I like this idea of um, just taking a look at what's in front of you and doing whatever that is to the best of your ability. Because I think... I think you're right. I think we can, we can kind of um, get a little bit bogged down in the search for something, not recognizing that what we're looking for may be found in whatever is directly in front of us, or at least that may be the pathway. Like, even if I look back at how many changes I've made in the past, you know, 10 years on the quest to know who it is that I am and what I really want to be doing and which direction I should be going there's been so many chops and changes, but every time I've kind of been just accidentally falling into uh, new understandings about what is my duty to do, not necessarily always by seeking that thing, but just by accidentally stumbling upon it as I'm doing the things that are in front of me. And it seems like this is almost a way to, um, to deal with whatever is in front of you in life appropriately while you're engaging in that process of being guided toward your ultimate duty. Does that, does that make any sense at all? Does that resonate with what you're saying? No, absolutely. I mean, and to be clear, this is not my philosophy of life. I mean, I I would urge all our our listeners or viewers to go out and travel. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But yeah, Seneca is like, you know, that's, you're not going to, I think he's, you know, and I think you would agree, it's, he's not saying that you shouldn't travel. He's saying that you don't expect that by itself to give you the answers you're seeking, right? You have to do, yeah, yeah. you have to work to get the answers. And, yes. and you can work to get the answers, even if you're not able to travel. You know, that, yeah. that's kind of my interpretation of that. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. I mean, like, uh, there's, there's something really beautiful about experiencing other cultures and going to other places and being where you're not comfortable or being where uh, you're forced into a new way of seeing the world. 
but yeah, that point, the point that he is trying to making, um, or he is trying to make certainly resonates more with this line of thinking of, um, don't expect that you're going to get anything out of it that you're not right. It's, it's, yep. uh, you know, don't expect to go over there and be saved or, um, to finally, uh, to finally, uh, be the person who you always wanted to be. I think Sharon LaBelle put it beautifully. Um, she talked about her, um, she talked about, I believe it was her, her mother who was an artist. And she asked her mother, you know, like, why, why don't you go out traveling and see the world and stuff? You've always just lived here. You've always just been here. And, and her mother kind of looked at her and said, Sharon, gardens of the mind, gardens of the mind, Sharon, a beautiful way of saying, you know, like, you don't have to leave here in order to expand your consciousness, your mind and, and see something different. You can see something different by diving deep into your own mind. I think it's a beautiful way of putting it. Well, look, yeah, I, and I actually, I, the sorry, Stoics, the Stoics, you know, they, they upheld Socrates as their hero and their, their model, right? Uh, even though Socrates was not a Stoic, the Stoics claim that he exemplified all of their ideals and he is notoriously someone who didn't travel much. You know, he went on campaigns when needed by the Athenian state, but uh, overall he didn't. And there's a line somewhere, I forget where it's from, where Socrates says, the, the bees tr venture further out looking for honey than I venture out from Athens. You know, so he's mm. kind of this model of someone that didn't have to travel to find wisdom. Mm. Oh man, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I love that. They're also obsessed with bees back then. They had a lot of analogies <laughs> about bees, right? <laughs> I mean, bees are amazing. You know, they are amazing, incredible. Um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you, uh, and this this might be the actually no. I, there is one thing that I wanted to dive in before I ask this question. I'm ashamed to say that having a podcast about stoicism, I have spent very little time in the world of. Uh, Zeno's Cosmopolis, you know, uh, and and I wondered if you could give me a breakdown of what that is, um, what the idea behind it was, and and how that relates to this idea of duty as well. As far as I understand that idea, you know the the pre-Stoic philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Xenophon and Socrates they operated within the context of the polis, right? The polis was the framework within which you seek meaning and happiness and excellence. And so their ideas of the good life, of ethics, of excellence, of happiness are all intimately tied with the polis as the arena in which you operate. But then Alexander the Great comes and basically, you know, conquers the known world, rendering the traditional Greek polis um, basically a, a, a defunct institution. I mean, a moribund institution, like no, no polis had any standing really on this new global stage of mega kingdoms, right? The Ptolemies of Egypt, the Seleucids, then you get these super republics in the West, like Rome and Carthage, so what, what's the state like Sparta going to do in the face of that? You know, um, mm. how do you even think of yourself as meaningful and important in one little city state when you have these vast empires determining your, your foreign policy, what kind of trade goods come to your ports, et cetera, right? So I think that um, people started looking bigger than just their polis. And as soon as this happened, you know, as soon as Alexander changed the world like this, Plato's school and Aristotle's school kind of were re eclipsed by these two new schools, Epicureanism and Stoicism, which emerged at the same time. And they both offer new guidance, new answers, and they both kind of help you optimize your life within this cosmopolitan world that had emerged so that's like the that's one way to look at it now for the for the epicureans this world is just infinitely vast and chaotic and so what you should do is carve out your little your little garden get your friends together and live a good life kind of taking refuge from this 
cosmic storm. Mm. But for the Stoics, they thought, no, it's it's not infinite. The, the cosmos is finite. It's ordered. There's a rational, benevolent deity directing it. And so even though our polis doesn't really give us that much meaning, we still have the opportunity to participate in the functioning of this global polis, of this cosmic polis, the cosmopolis, right? And actually all humans are, are citizens of this cosmopolis. I, I actually think that the idea of like the equality of all humans, um, while not fully expressed in its legal framework back then, I think it starts as a seed with the Stoics. They, they say mm. that um, all humans are bound by the same law and well all humans are endowed with reason this is actually this is probably the reason why they insist that we're rational computers they want to equalize all humans they want to say every single human has reason logos which for them is also the ability to talk okay so mm. every human reason has logos we speak and we reason therefore we're all bound by the same law because reason is law therefore we're all members of the same community um, mm. And so it's a new cosmopolitan ethics that uh, that seeks to, in a way, extend the Platonist view of justice to the world. So Plato said, the good of the individual is the same as the good of the polis. And Zeno and the Stoics come and say, the good of the individual is the same as the good of all of humanity. And so that, that's one of the tools that you can use when you deliberate on what should I do? Is my action consistent with the good of humanity as a whole. Mm, okay. Okay. So, so any good that flows from one person uh, or within one person is at the same time working for the good of everyone. Therefore we get that idea from Marcus Aurelius of what's good for the bee is good for the hive, or I think it was what's good for the hive is good for the bee. Um, oh, anyway, yeah. 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 Same, yeah. Same but thing. The, the thing yeah. is that the Stoics say the universe is the hive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm wondering, um, okay. So this is, this is going to open up a whole nother can of worms. When you say uh, every, every human being is endowed with this thing called reason, reason where you it, is the reason, the term reason that you're using. Can you pair that with this idea of the spark of divinity? You know, is that what we're talking about that, that, that cause that's, that's the way that I have often put it, it, it there's this spark of divinity within us that links us to the whole um or to the universal reason we have reason but that's our spark of the universal reason is that what you're referring to i think it's i think it's related to that i mean you know the the, the first page of the gospel of john begins with in the beginning there was the word right yeah that's that word logos yeah. You could say it was reason. In the beginning, there was reason. Um, if Christianity had never taken on, you know, uh, and and modern researchers discovered this one, just the first page of the Gospel of John, and they didn't know what Christianity was, they just had that one page, they would probably conclude this is a Stoic piece of writing because it's so similar. The idea that yeah. there is this logos that's before God um, and it's just kind of this cosmic uh, phenomenon all permeating. There's even something like the Holy Spirit in Stoicism, by the way, um, mm. because there's a, an artisanal fire. So Zeus is kind of reimagined as this um, all permeating artisanal fire in the sense that it's, it's this fire that permeates everything in the universe and it, because it's fire, it can act, it can kind of make things go along. And eventually it can burn up the whole universe and cause it to have a rebirth. <laughs> yeah. You have this like infinite loop of repeat in, in some stoic thinkers, right? But in order to, for this artisanal fire to act on matter, there's like this intermediary substance that's thought of as a kind of spirit. So Holy Spirit. Um, that's okay. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. But um, your question was about one day we will, by the way. But go on. Okay. <laughs> well, that that is beyond my. I have my you back for round really, two. But, all right. <laughs> so, the spark of divinity. Yes, 
it's through reason that we are able to kind of help God do his work. Hmm. All right. So like this artisanal fire, which is rational element permeating the universe is, is kind of driving the universe always to the best possible outcome. Um, even though they're suffering in the world, that's the best possible outcome. That's why we are in this world. And you kind of, your your reason is, is a piece of that. It's a piece of Zeus yeah. in a sense. And so you can either help Zeus unfold the universe to keep doing the best possible thing that it's doing, or you can neglect reason or or resist reason or not use your reason, in which case you will you won't actually accomplish anything because Zeus will still make drag the world to its proper outcome. Mm. So you'll just make yourself miserable because you're, you're, it's like you're fighting against a train, you know, that's moving along. And so you might as well just uh, help the train move along and that way you'll be happy and you'll be doing important work for them. Of course, mm. the critics say, well, what kind of, you know, the critics say, well, these Stoics, they're basically reducing humans to these deterministic um, ent- entities without much choice. So uh, this is a hilarious line where Plotinus literally says, the Stoics reduce humans to rolling stones. And there's a famous rolling stone song where they said, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you get what you need, which is very Stoic. Mm. So I, I say, yes, mm-hmm. you know, Plotinus, you got it. The rolling stones are very Stoic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least yeah. in that one song. Yeah, interesting. You know, I I, I think um, the re- the reason why I'm the why I'm drawn to using the term this spark of divinity, <clears throat> yeah, I guess is because I think it it allows more people to see what it truly means about us as human beings, right? When we when we say, okay, we each have reason, which connects us to the reason of the whole. We need to act reasonably. A lot of people. Um, may get the connotation that okay so i'm supposed to become some sort of uh hyper rationalistic professor type person who uh, tries to analyze every single situation to make the most correct decision and um it, as much as that might be a path for somebody like an artist or somebody who works in the realm of uh intuition and in the realm of uh i guess yeah feeling and and expressing uh expressing feeling i think a spark of divinity makes more sense in that there's something within you that if you can uh almost develop a communion with that part of yourself that connects you to the whole in doing that, you would be at the same time, as Sharon LaBelle would say, uh, taking your seat in the theater of life that is your seat to take, that nobody else can take. And that to me seems like reason. It's, it's if, if, if we're talking about fitting into the whole and helping it to progress in the most uh, beautiful way, uh, it seems like that understanding of there's something within me that is uh, 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 deeper than a kind of surface level rationalistic way of analyzing the world. There's something within me that is calling me and pulling me in a certain direction to be a part of something that is bigger than myself. Does that, does that make any sense at all? Absolutely. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I actually like your way of thinking. I mean, you're an artist and, I wouldn't call myself an artist, but I, I like to, um, you know, to, to, to embrace creative impulses and, and follow my instincts and emotions and things like that. Um, so I'm with you in terms of how I, you know, like my personal philosophy, I guess, but unfortunately the Stoics really are about, we're all rational calculators. So, so the bad news is that the, the formula they offer and this is something I reconstruct in my book, the formula they offer that allows each human to precisely calculate their duty is totally rational. Mm. However, the good news is that it's custom tailored to each person's individual temperament and personality. So the fact that you are an artist and the fact that you have faith in certain instincts and, uh, and aesthetic principles, that does go into the formula. So one of the main roles that you will have to think through is precisely 
what you just described, you know? So on the one hand, yes, it's hyper rational, perhaps too much for most people. On the other hand, it it's also hyper tailored to individual temperaments, unlike the German Kantian model, which is all humans have the same duties. No, for the Stoics, you and I could have totally different duties in the exact same scenario. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and I think that that's one of, yeah, like you say, it's one of the strengths of the Stoic model is that uh, it's not just a, you know, here's the 10 steps for everybody and everybody's just going to be, you know, it, it's, it's really an invitation to deeper understanding of exactly who you are and what roles you play in society and how you can fulfill them to the best of your abilities. And I guess, uh, what, okay, now I have two more short questions for you. All right. And, and then, I'm, and then I'm going to be respectful <laughs> of your time. And, um, the one question was, what did you go into writing this book believing that you were going to find and how does that match up against what you found? Because I know that you've spoken about how uh, I believe you were, you were pulled in a direction that you didn't expect to go with, with writing this. And I think that that's really the mark of a true work of writing um, or art or whatever it is. It's It's when you don't you, ha- you don't just decide this is what I'm writing and now let me go prove that I'm right, but you actually allow the evidence to take you there or the, the experience to take you there. And then the, so the part, part one of that question is what changed between the start and the finish of that project? And then I also want to ask you, this is the final one, uh, how did your new understanding of this term duty influence your current philosophy of life? How did you change as a person um, when, you, when you gained this new understanding? Right. You're, you're taking me down like uh, rabbit holes of introspection here. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's what uh, we do. Right. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. So, so most, I mean, the, the, the real essence of this book came out of my PhD work, you know, so I gotta, I gotta dive into that, but I'll try to be quick. First is the prospectus stage when you, kind of just make a proposal for your thesis after spending a lot of time researching and everything. So by that point, I had already figured out, I thought, to my surprise, that actually we're dealing with duty in the ancient world. Okay. So then the question was, where do I take it from there? Right. And um, well, I guess this is just more about my own temperament, but I'm a kind of spontaneous person and I, I enjoy being led in directions that I cannot foresee. So I didn't really care that much where it would lead me. I just knew that there was something new here. There was a new way to look at this. I was going to investigate it as best I could and kind of just see what, what comes up. Okay. Mm. Um, there was a, a befuddling diversity of terms that the Stoics, that different Stoics used to talk about duties, to talk about Katheikon and Aphikia. So one thing that surprised me was that they all seem to fit in this system, you know, like, and again, every author, all the main authors we have, okay, like Diogenes Laertius, uh, Seneca, Cicero, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, they all classify duties or Aphikia or Cathay in Greek. They all say, yeah, well, there's two types of duties. There's, the, there's these and that. There's like the types that always hold and the types that hold under cer- certain circumstances. Or someone else will say, oh, there's there, there's these two types of dudes, you know. And it seemed like every author had his own his own, you know, spiel, and, and there didn't seem to be any consistency. So one thing that that was um, a nice surprise was to find that actually, if you just kind of spend a lot of time looking back and forth, you can draw a very, very symmetrical chart that maps them all onto this one beautiful tree you know and it just Mm. just a beautiful system you know uh and and i think if we had zeno's writings or cleanthes or spheris any of these early stoics i think we'd have seen that but we just don't have those early writings Mm. um another thing was how do you actually deliberate okay like there are so many books on well so many okay not that there's like you know there's like 15 people in the world i'd say 15 25 people in the world who are stoic experts in academia and who have written about um, 
how do you deliberate to find the appropriate action for them? They call it appropriate action, right? And they all look at the perspective of the sage. Well, the sage, you know, the wise person would do this. But how is that helpful? You know, like, I'm not a sage. Maybe you are, you know, but <laughs> not all of our listeners. The Stoics themselves said that the, that the sage is as rare as the feathers of a phoenix. Well, that mm. means that they don't even exist. And we don't have any record of any Stoic actually claiming that he was a sage or that anybody else who was a real person was a sage. So the sage mm. seems to be like a, a conceptual model more than an actual reality. So how do we deliberate if we're not sages? This was an mm. unanswered question, you know? Um, can, can I just and, quickly add something yeah, here? I'm yeah, so sorry. Yeah. I know I'm stopping you halfway through your thought, but even to say well, the sage would do that. That in itself isn't a method of deliberation because how did you get from what is the right thing to do to this is the right thing to do because the sage would do it? You're just jumping to a different... It's all, It seems to me as if you're almost saying, well, well, I don't know how to discern what I should do other than to say what another thing should or would do correctly but how did you come to that decision right do, do you see what i mean like oh, absolutely yeah I, I mean and seneca does say that it's helpful to just think like you know what would plato do and sometimes we will intuitively you know uh get an idea that didn't occur to us before but that's not a sure method mm. but you know mm. to the to the scholars credits they don't they don't say well the the sage would do this where it's a specific action they say well the sage would consider these and these factors and he or she would have the expert knowledge to determine from them what to do. So they kind of leave yeah, okay. it. So on the one hand, it's like not helpful to us because we're not sages. On the other hand, it doesn't actually finish the calculation. It says, well, these would be the inputs and the amazing wisdom of the sage would spit out the output with a certain je ne sais quoi that we cannot access, you know? Mm. So, <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And, and I think that, Something that you mentioned there, even Seneca talking about, uh, well, you you think, oh, what would Plato do? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I think that there's a real, one of the reasons I think why we are so obsessed um, as people in seeking wise words from people who we admire or uh, trying to be like the hero, elevating certain people in society who we consider to be hero types, or even just having mentors, is as we do these things, as we consider the hero, as we consider the sage, as we um, read brilliant thinkers or have mentors, it's almost as if a sage starts to develop in our own mind that is a conglomeration of the best of all of these people brought together. And so at any one point in your life, you might say, well, what should I do here? Well, Oh, well, this person would say this and this person would say that. And, th and then all of a sudden you get better at bringing together the best of that wisdom to, to give you the, the, the correct path. And it also almost seems to me like that is a, it's, it's a, it's like the developing of your conscience, right? When you introduce your conscience to great thinkers, um, like Seneca said, you know, you should spend a lot of time with one thinker who you think is absolutely brilliant to understand how they think, but spend a lot of time with their writing so that you really understand how they think, why they think those things. And that'll give you more value than just going around picking from everywhere, right? So people that have different approaches. But I guess I'm wondering if you think that that is almost the correct method of this meditation of the sage is bringing together the best elements of all the influences that you've seen in great examples. And in doing that, doesn't it seem as though that's a pretty reasonable way of discerning the correct path is what do I admire in other people? And then it just goes inside your mind. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, um, that is a great shortcut. You know, it's a helpful tool, mm. you know, yeah. and I think one of the great things about Stoicism, one of the things that made it the most popular school for a few centuries was that even though they have this unattainable ideal, like the sage, people say, why would anybody be Stoic? Like if they can never attain that ideal? Well, why is anybody Christian when nobody can be free of sin? You know, it's kind of like mm. a similar thing there. There's an unattainable ideal, but there's enough uh, useful stuff for actual people who cannot attain that ideal um, 
because we we are given these uh, these tools these these um, I call these um, well <laughs> the Stoics call these reguli in Latin or canones in in Greek and they're called yardsticks. I mean, they mean yardsticks. So it's like they give you these yardsticks to do quick checks on an action. Like, are you you're contemplating whether to do A or B? Well, here are some quick yardsticks to measure that action. Would, you know, pick somebody you admire. Would that person do it? No, maybe not a good idea. Another yardstick is, would you be embarrassed if people found out? If yes, probably not a good idea. So they have all these different tools but just to finish, and this kind of helps me finish my earlier point super quick, what I, another thing I was surprised to find uh, through the years of research is that all of these different yardsticks, in, as well as the view of the cosmopolis and the idea that, that our interest is, is the same as that of humanity, and the idea of roles and relationships, like think of your relationships and each relationship will call to mind certain duties, all those things fit into a system a formula, mm. an algorithm, I would say, th for determining your duty. Um, and that's what I spend a good, probably one third of the book is, is trying to reconstruct that full algorithm that takes into account all these different tools and offers a way for a non-sage to find their duty. So I think like that might even be the, the most important contribution of the book is to lay out how are we normal mortals to deliberate. Mm, mm. And I'm not sure if you have the the time or the mental energy to go through those right now, or maybe maybe what we should do is leave that as a little go get the book so that you can find out sure. the formula, right? Because I think we've uh, we've dived into enough uh, in this interview. But um, yeah, but just a note know, on Jeff, that. So the, yeah, the book is the book is prohibitively expensive. And okay. that is kind of just, that's what usually happens as an academic writing your first book. You basically just get an academic contract. It's super expensive. Only libraries buy it. Uh, so not everybody will be able to get it, but I promise to do these kinds of interviews. And I will also do some of my own show to kind of uh, make this accessible. Um, and anybody with a university access to a library can get it for free. Anybody who has like any kind of university library account can just search for it and they'll get a, a, a free edition just to put that out. There. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, look, you know, I, I, I think we should uh, definitely plan a round two. I'd love to have a round two with you and, and Leo and Kai, because I think it would be just so much fun getting all of you in, in a chat room together. And um, even just this idea of, uh, you know, is the sage, unattainable because i know leo leans more in the direction of well no there is there is a path and perhaps it's you know possibly uh we're able to attain that i know that mm -hmm. even seneca uh you know he talks about how you know when you're wandering on a path it better have a destination otherwise you're just wandering aimlessly right so he believes that there should be an end goal of philosophy um I would imagine that it has something to do with what Heraclitus talked about, the oneness of all wisdom being known or not under the name of God, something like that. But uh, yeah, Jack, this has been a really fun, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for spending the time and please just tell, tell me and the audience at home where, where they can find you and your work. All right. Well, I mean, just want to say from my end, this has been a lot of fun. I'm really, uh, happy and grateful that you had me on your show. It's been, it's been great to meet you. And I also, um, I enjoyed exploring your music before we spoke and to want to tell any listeners out there to check out Simon's um, music on YouTube. It's really fantastic. Man, I appreciate uh, it. Thank you. I, I can be found on my podcast. It's called Ancient Greece Declassified on all the apps as well as greasepodcast.com. Uh, and uh, I also have a new YouTube channel called Lantern Jack. That's my moniker, my artist name. But yeah, that's it. Beautiful. Yeah, man. Well, uh, everybody head over there, uh, check out Jack's work. And, and Jack, this has been so much fun. We're going to have to do a round two. As I said, uh, thank you for being here. And I'm totally game. Thanks a lot. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. 
There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.